103, Honey in the Rock. Oh, my brother, do you know the Savior who was wondrous, kind, and true? He's the rock of your salvation. There's honey in the rock for you. Oh, there's honey in the rock, my brother. There's honey in the rock for you. Leave your sins for the blood to cover. There's honey in the rock for you. Have you tasted that the Lord is gracious? Do you walk in the way that's new? Proving fountain, there's honey in the rock for you. Oh, honey in the rock, my brother, there's honey in the rock for you. Leave your sins for the blood to cover, there's honey in the rock for you. Do you pray unto God the Father? What will thou have me to do? Never fear, he will surely answer. There's honey in the rock for you. Oh, there's honey in the rock, my brother. There's honey in the rock for you. Leave your sins for the blood to cover. There's honey in the rock for you. Then go out through the streets and byways. Preach the word to many or few. Say to every fallen brother, There's honey in the rock for you. Oh. honey in the rock, my brother. There's honey in the rock for you. Leave your sins for the blood to cover. There's honey in the rock for you. Amen. Ah, <laughs> oh, Brother Vic, lead us in prayer. Amen. Jesus is my Savior, I shall not be moved. In His love and favor, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the waters, Lord, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree. That's planted by the waters, Lord, I shall not be moved. In my Christ writing, I shall not be moved. In His Word I'm hiding, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, Lord, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved, just like a tree that's planted by the waters, Lord, I shall not be moved. If I trust Him ever, I shall not be moved, He will fail me never, I shall not be moved, just like a tree that's planted by the water, Lord, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, Lord, I shall not be moved. In His Word I'm feeding, I shall not be moved. 
He's the one that's leading. I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. Lord, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. Lord, I shall not be moved. Amen. All right, um, please come tonight. Uh, I'm going to be preaching out of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 tonight. And it's probably going to take me two Sundays to preach it, but uh, I'm preaching on the judgment seat of Christ. And this is one of the most important things a Christian needs to know about. I mean, a Christian needs to know that they're saved. That's probably the first important thing they need to do. But you need to realize that you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ one day. You need to know why you're going to stand there and how you're going to stand there and what's going to happen when you're standing there. And I'm going to try to relate that uh, through what the Bible says. Uh, I really could care less about folks' opinion. I'm going to give you what the Bible says. Uh, this morning, we're preaching out of Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20, and we're going to look this morning at some reactions, some reactions. You know, there's three basic reactions of people when they hear the preaching of the Word of God, and it's nice when everybody says, hey, yeah, that's the thing we ought to do, and hallelujah, you're right, preacher. It'd be nice if everybody said that. But, unfortunately, a lot of times, there's some other reactions to what the preacher preaches. And sometimes, uh, you know, people think in their heart sometimes is different from what's on their face. So, uh, this is, uh, it's, it's kind of a way of teaching uh, how to receive the Word of God properly. You say, uh, uh, properly? Yeah. Uh, there's a website called uh, How to Eat. And uh, the basic premise is, is that uh, you don't know how to eat your food. Uh, it teaches you how to eat spaghetti and some of the stuff I don't agree with. Um, they have, I watched a thing about, should pizza be folded or not? You know, yeah, people waste their time looking at this stuff. But, you know, it's, some of it had merit. Um, I, I mean, some of it you can say, oh, okay, yeah, that's how they do that. Uh, I don't know if anybody here eats snails, but apparently there's a special little tool that you have to have and you hold it and you stick something in and get the snail. Personally, I'll pass on the snails, uh, no matter how you eat them. But the Word of God is something different. That's for everybody. And you need to know how to receive it. Jeremiah 20, verse number 1. And Passor, the son of Emmer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, Heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Passor smote Jeremiah the prophet. And put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin. Which were by the house of the Lord. So this guy, he's the head of the temple. And he hears Jeremiah preaching. He don't like it so he goes and gives him a whack and puts him in jail. I hope nobody does that this morning. Amen. Uh, I don't want to be whacked. I don't want to go to jail. Heavenly Father, help us now as we study how people will receive your word and react to your word and help us, God, to uh, have a good heart attitude. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible says a lot about the heart. And this guy's problem, this high priest's problem, what was, was a heart problem. Matter of fact, most of the problems... The important problems in your life, with your family, with your church, with your God, with yourself even, is a heart problem. God says a lot about hearts. God doesn't think much about wicked hearts. Some people have, well, see what the Bible says. Proverbs 10.20 says, The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. You see, God don't think much of a wicked heart. Don't have a wicked heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 
It says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperate will it wicked who can know it. So Jeremiah says in a way we all have a wicked heart especially when we're lost. So we have to be careful of that. But even after you're saved. Because, look, part of your emotions and part of your mind has to do with the flesh. And we know what the flesh is like. So we have to be careful of that. Psalm 112, verse 7 says, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. What we need to do is train our hearts to trust in the Lord. That way, when evil does come, we don't join in it. We, we're, we're trusting the Lord to get us through. 2 Corinthians 3, 2 says, And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Oh, that, there's a, never a truer sentence that's ever been said, all men not have faith. For some people just don't trust the Lord no matter what. Trust the Lord this morning. Receive His word this morning. His This message is for you. So, consider it. Take it in. Use it. And, and, and you know, it may change your life. First of all, I want to say that some people have a positive, a positive reaction to the preaching of the word of God. Now, the first thing I'm going to tell you, I turn to Jude. Verse 15. Turn to Jude 15. And, and we need to know that God, what he considers positive is not what we consider positive many times. And this is one of those cases. Jude 15. It, it, it says, to execute judgment upon all. Well, I don't want to be part of that. And to convince all. What is that? That's called conviction. Convince. Conviction. To convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now notice one of the things the word of God does is it convicts people of the things they've done wrong. And if you have a positive reaction to that, you know what that reaction is? Repentance. You can't repent of something you haven't been convicted of. And God the Holy Spirit will convict you of things in your life. And you want Him to. Sometimes we do stuff we don't know it's wrong. And we need God to show us the right way and the wrong way. Um, I remember uh, there was a fellow named camp over uh that that was going to church when i was over there at bible school and he was a millionaire and uh, he got saved and uh he was ignorant as the day is long when it comes to christianity he didn't know beans about christianity or the bible and he put himself in the hands of the folks over there at school and it was such a blessing because he would learn something was wrong and he, he, he didn't want to do wrong things. He wanted to please God now that he was saved. Um, he, him and his wife, uh, somebody preached about drinking. And so him and his wife were big drinkers. So they went home. They lived out at the, the Sound out there on the beach. And uh, they decided they were going to pour all their liquor down the, the drain. So they took every bottle of booze they had. And they had a whole bunch of booze. He was a man. He had every kind of booze there was. <laughs> and he poured it down the drain. And the next morning, the toilet didn't work. The sink didn't work. You see, out at the beach, they had septic tanks. <laughs> and all that liquor all at once killed everything in that septic tank and clogged it up. So he had to call a plumber and they had to dig up the yard. And... and uh, I remember somebody asking him about it. He got up in church and gave a testimony about it. And uh, it, was, it, it was hilarious. But the guy, he believed what the preaching was preached. And he didn't want to unplease God. He didn't want to displease God. He didn't want to make God mad at him. So away went the liquor. Never, never did he buy any more liquor. He, he had a positive uh, reaction. Uh, and then, not, and, and using his as an example, he didn't buy any more liquor either. He was obedient. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 24, 
talks about that that's a chapter that talks about unknown tongues and talks about preaching and that chapter is called prophecy prophesying that's what i'm doing i'm a prophet i'm a prophet i'm up here prophesying it says this in first corinthians 14 24 but if all prophesy forget the tongues we need to preach but if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned he is convinced there's that word convinced convinced of all he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. Who to? Himself. And falling down on his face will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. So this guy repents and he decides he's going to obey God because he heard the preaching of the word of God. Look, when the preacher gets up... now. When the preacher just gives his opinion about something, I mean, I've known preachers who didn't like gum chewing because people would stick it on the bottom of the pew and he'd have this gooey mess. Well, I can understand why he'd be against gum chewing after a while. But I can't find anything in the Bible against gum chewing. Sorry. If you want to chew some gum, chew some gum. I'd appreciate it if you didn't put it on the bottom of the pew, okay? But if you want you gum, go ahead. I don't care. Just don't while I'm preaching. <laughs> Some do that. Some people do that rather loud. You might you might disturb somebody. But uh, you know, I remember Brother Bill used to preach against ice water because people he said some people mix bathe in it, some people mix drinks with it. And he was joking, of course, in, in sort of a serious kind of way. Uh, but if someone preaches from the Bible. And, and it's very clear what the Bible says. You ought to obey what the Bible says. And that's a positive. As far as God's concerned, that's a positive thing. Now, some people kind of say, oh, I'm going to obey God. No, you should say, praise God, I'm going to obey God. Because that's what God feels about it. And there's acceptance. See, if you receive God's word and you say, pour it on me, baby. Preach to me. Help me. God, God has an acceptance that he puts in your heart because he accepts you and you accept him. Titus chapter 1 verse 9 says, Holding fast the faithful word. Holding fast the faithful word. As he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gain. There's that word convince again. Look, you ought to be convinced that this book is right and what it says is right. And if you're wrong, well, tough apples on you. That ought to be your attitude. And that's been my attitude for years. You say, do you, do you, do you have to take a lump or two? Yeah, uh-huh. Sometimes it's hard to realize you've done something wrong. It may be displeasing of God. But, but if you're going to do the right thing, if you're going to be positive in your acceptance... You have to just take it in and say, that's right. That's right, God, you're right. A prominent clergyman in Boston some years ago received a, a, a plain-spoken country preacher, and he invited him to address the people at a midweek service in their chapel. Uh, so you had a high-tone preacher, got the little country preacher in there. The visiting preacher was so plain and straightforward, and he told it the way it is, folks. Uh, in his mode of speech and his homely illustrations that the Boston preacher was quite disturbed, fearing that his cultivated congregation <clears throat> uh, would take offense at the sharp thrust of the unconventional brother. But a few days later, a prominent member of the church came into the pastor's study and was greatly troubled of soul, desiring to be shown the way to Christ when he asked as to the cause of his interest, he referred to the homely words of the country preacher who evidently spoke straight to the heart of this man. When the pastor told him uh, the a story to a friend, he added, I'll never again distrust God's spirit and guiding of God's servants as he preaches. I have written more than one sermon for the express purpose of reaching that one man in my congregation. But here he was reached by one plain sentence from one plain man 
whom God's Spirit guided. I don't mind being a old plain spoken plain guy. I don't mind a bit. Because that's usually who God uses. Jeremiah was that way. Old Isaiah was that way. John the Baptist was that way. Then there are some people, they don't take the word positively. Matter of fact, they're kind of neutral. Now, y'all drive cars, most of y'all. Y'all know what neutral is. Neutral, you put it in neutral, and the car ain't in gear and ain't going nowhere. You can rev that engine all day long, and unless you're on a hill, it ain't moving. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you to put it in neutral if you're on a hill, because you're going to go down the hill. Especially if the down the hill is backwards in the back of the car. That might not be so good. Revelation chapter 3. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. Let's look at this neutral neutral uh, reaction to the preaching. And there's lots of that going on today. In fact, we live in the age of emotional neutrality. My goodness, you can't get upset about Jesus. You can't be a fanatic. You get on the street and preach preach to folks. You just you're just out of bounds. I mean, you're you get up and talk to people plain. Yeah, I mean, preacher, you just you. I've been told, well, you yell at people. I don't yell at people. I preach at folks. I ain't got no microphone or set up in except for the YouTube in here. I have to reach somebody in the... That's why I like this room. It's a good sound room. I can do this on the ceiling and it bounces all the way back to brother. And I can talk like this. And you heard what I say. Yeah. That's the room. It's a good room. But people are neutral, the Bible says in Revelation. Chapter 3, verse 15. Revelation 3, 15. I know thy works. It's God talking. That thou art neither hot nor cold. It's neutral. For I would thou wert hot or cold. So then, because thou art hot, lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Look, God knows your reaction. Some people, man, they just sit there and sit there and sit there. Of course, nowadays, attendance is so rare, you're glad they're sitting there. But God said he would rather have you hot or cold. You say, what about the ones that don't? Well, at least they're cold. Uh, I'm sure God would rather have you hot. But God just don't want you in the middle. Um, in the morning, I drink hot tea. And I steep it for five minutes, take the tea bag out, put the, the creamer in it. And I have to make sure that I drink that tea. I like hot tea. And sometimes she'll tell me, I can't believe you drank that whole thing of hot tea. I like hot tea. What I don't like is when the tea sits there and gets to be room temperature. Blah! Sometimes you can heat it in the microwave and have it taste decent, and other times you can't. What normally happens to tea like that, it goes down the drain. Because I just don't like it. And look, neither would you. I, I mean, let's say you get a nice cold can of soda out of the refrigerator, and you open it up, and you still, you know, I'm probably doing this, it just happened to you being a mechanic, you probably set it on the hood or something, and you're busy, and then you go to reach for it, and it's room temperature. Soda is not good at room temperature. Uh, I, we had a fellow at the church here that he would buy a two liter, and he would drink them just, just the way they were. He wouldn't put them in the fridge. And, and I'd look at him like, you really like that stuff that way? To me, it's awful. To me, it's awful. And God thinks it's awful. Be positive or negative or something, but don't be in the middle. God don't like folks in the middle. God wants you to make a decision. 
So it's lukewarm, and then it's a lousy reaction. God's not happy with it. I mean, the Bible says, bleh, he's going to puke, puke you up. I wonder how many Christians that's happened to and spiritually. Do they lose their salvation? No. But they sure make God unhappy. Now you see why God's so unhappy with the church nowadays? It's not so much that we're negative, we're just nothing. A farmer once went to hear John Wesley preach. The preacher said that uh, he took up three topics of thought during his preaching. And he was chiefly talking about money. So John Wesley was preaching about money. His first point was, get all you can. Well, everybody said, amen, brother, amen, brother, hallelujah, get all you can. And about going out and working hard and getting, getting all the money you can. And, and, and the farmer nudged his neighbor and says, that man's got something in him. That, that's good preaching. So then Wesley came to point number two. And he said, save all you can. And boy, the farmer got excited about that. Oh, that's good preaching. He, he poked the other guy. That's really good preaching. Oh, hallelujah. Get all you can, save all you can. And, I mean, he denounced uh, uh, thriftlessness and waste. And, and the farmer rubbed his hands and said, Oh, oh the, the, I was taught this from my youth up. This guy's really on the ball. He, he's a real man of God. And, and, uh, and, and it seemed that, you know, John Wesley was the first perfect preacher by that point. Well, then Wesley reached the third point. <laughs> And it was, give all you can. <laughs> well, the farmer said, oh dear, he done gone and spoiled it all. <laughs> well, that's what some people do. I mean, they don't know how to react. They're just all over the place. So he went away. He didn't do anything. Uh, look, um, um, be positive. Don't be lukewarm. Don't be lukewarm. And then finally... There's the negative. And I got to say, there is quite a bit of that now. And it's getting more and more and more. People reject the preaching of the Word of God. Even Christians reject. That's the first thing of a negative reaction is rejection. Just out and out. I don't believe that. I've had people charge. I call it charging the pulpit. I had one charge the pulpit two weeks ago. He waited till everybody was gone to do it. He's kind of a chicken. If he was here, I'd preach the same thing. When you charge the pulpit, usually you're fixing to reject what was preaching. Because you want to tell the preacher how wrong he was. Look, you don't have to tell me how wrong I am. Go to God and say, God, he's wrong. God can fix me. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no more priest to me, saying thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. When people that reject the word of God and reject God's preaching and reject God's uh, message, usually God rejects them in the end. And see, that's why this is a hard thing. Because I've had people sit in those pews and sit Sunday after Sunday and be faithful Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and yet in their heart they were rejecting the Word of God and eventually God got them. Don't do it. I warn you, don't do it. Look what he told his own people. A minister who was faithful to proclaim the gospel uh, in open air meetings, uh, he, he was out there preaching uh, and at the close of, of one of his street meetings, an unbeliever stepped through the crowd and said, I don't believe in heaven or hell. I don't believe in God in Christ. I haven't seen them. He thought he really had an argument that was going to stump this guy. And then a man wearing dark glasses with a cane tapped his way forward through the crowd and said, Sir... Is there a river near this place? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, no, there's no such thing. You say there are people standing here, 
but it cannot be true. I have never, I have not seen the people or the river. I haven't seen them, you see, because I was born blind. Only a blind man can say that I haven't seen the river or the people. Only spiritual blind men can say they don't see what this preacher has said. Shut the guy up. Shut the guy. He had rejected the word of God. This old blind man, God uses people like that. Bless his heart, he went there and he, he defended the preacher. I've seen that happen in my ministry. Sometimes it comes from the most surprising places. Not only do they reject, but they rebel. See, see, re that goes a step beyond rejection. Rebellion is quite a different story. Say the Christians rebel. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Isaiah chapter 1, 20. Uh, chapter 1, verse 20. But ye refuse and rebel. See, reject and rebel. Ye have de devoured, uh, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. God says, okay, you reject the word, you rebel against the word. See how you like this. Hosea 7, verse 14. Hosea 7, 14. That didn't make it on my sheets. i got to turn there. Don't hurt me. 7, 14. The Bible says, And they have not cried unto me with their hearts. It is a heart problem. When they howled upon their beds, they assembled themselves for corn and wine, and they rebelled against me. God is saying, look, some people whine and complain, and, but they're not praying. They line up for the corn and the wine, and, and, and they don't think about praying. They've rebelled against God, and they expect God to keep blessing them. God don't bless rebels, folks. He just don't. But it's a heart problem. Most of the stuff in your life that goes wrong, I would say it starts here somewhere or another. So that's an awful broad statement. Well, I've been around a long time. I've seen it. And then there's revolt. See, it's not bad enough to re rebel, but some people actually go in open warfare against God. I've seen that too. Um, there's organization. Did you know there's organizations that were started by people who were raised in a church like this and somewhere in the early life, they got to college or somewhere, someone talked them out of it and they, 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 they revolted and they belong to these organizations that are ex-say people and ex-Bible-believing Baptists. And they're mean. They, they, they want to shut your church down, people like that. They're, they're actually in warfare against God. See, are they going to win? No, nah, not in the long run. They may actually close a few churches down, but in the long run, they're not going to win. They actually do harm to other Christians or to other lost people. They do a lot of damage to lost people, mostly. But their heart is causing these actions. Isaiah 59 verse 13. In transgressing and lying against the Lord. See when you go to revolting you start sinning and lying against the Lord. And departing away from our God. Speaking oppression and revolt. Convincing and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. See there it's from the heart. Positive, neutral, negative. Almost sounds like an electrical sermon, doesn't it? In conclusion, back to Jeremiah chapter 20, verse number 7. O Lord, thou hast deceived me. This is Jeremiah talking. And I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. Jeremiah says, look, I'm getting tired of this, Lord. I get up and I preach and I preach and I preach and all I get is mocked at and they throw me in jail and they hit me and, and here I am just in the jail and I'm sinking down in the mud. He says, for since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. 
God didn't give Jeremiah any sweet little messages, three points in a poem. Sugar, it, it's sugar sick, though. That's not what Jeremiah was told to preach. He said, daily it gives me trouble. People hate me because of what I preach. Then I said, I will not make mention of him. Well, if that's what it's going to be, Lord, I ain't going to talk for you. No more. Nor speak any more in thy name. But his word was in mine heart like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and could not stay. God got his way. Jeremiah said, I'm going to shut up and not preach no more. And every day he didn't preach. It was like a fire and it was just burning him up. Finally, he just got tired of that and said, well, I might as well just go ahead and start preaching again. I've known preachers that have done that. And if you're called to preach and God has called you to do uh, be a mouthpiece for him, you can't shut up. You'll, you'll have to get up and preach somewhere or another. Preachers are a mouthpiece. That's all I am is a mouthpiece. Your reaction to the preaching is your reaction to God Almighty Himself. And it's no skin off my nose how you react to the Word of God. My job is to preach it. Your job is to do something with it. Now, I don't mean that preachers don't get in the flesh and don't say things they shouldn't say. Sometimes you do. After all, some of us ain't that bright. In New York, there was a preacher not so long ago. He said this, One of our most venerable and far-seeing citizens recently remarked that in his 80 years of active life associated with some of the most stirring events in the Commonwealth, he had never seen such an orgy of lawlessness as though as, as through which we are now living. Startled into thoughtfulness by that remark, the preacher made some interesting discoveries. He would not call ever having recall ever having preached a sermon on obedience. And after searching volume after volume of the sermons that he kept, and I keep them too, he found that none were on the subject of with respect to the authority of God and obedience to Him. There were plenty of discourses on freedom, on happiness, but rarely on the submission to the commandments of God. Gradually, this New York preacher came into a frightful conclusion that our orgy of lawlessness is not a post-war psychological reaction, but rather the result of a deep-rooted habit and the thought of the spiritual realm and the citizens of this nation. We dimly acknowledge that Christ's teaching is our great hope for the sense of recovery and, and the sense of divine law. But we all dislike having to be taught that to ignore such teachings is dangerous. His teaching declares God's judgment of disobedience is certain. Unexpected and very awful. We have been keeping silent on the subject for longer than the last 50 years. Well, I hope I do better than that. And this morning, take it to heart. We live in a country that says, whose fault is it the way it is? Well... I'm to believe this New York preacher is our fault. Preacher's fault. I say, brother, that's an awful responsibility to take. Well, that's why I try to preach what God wants me to preach. Now, I'm not going to preach all hellfire all the time or, or sin every service. But I try to preach enough serious sermons about the way you react to the Word of God and the things you need to do every day to be obedient, good Christians, and please God. Christian, that, uh, Christian preacher that don't make you squirm a little bit every now and then, ain't worth what you're paying him. I don't like to make you squirm. I really don't. 
I'd rather preach about heaven all every all the time. Probably build a bigger church if I did. But I'm not interested in building a bigger church. I'm interested in feeding the God, uh, God's sheep that God gave me to feed. And part of feeding is, it, it, you know, giving them some castor oil every now and then. <laughs> Don't taste good. But you got to take it every now and then. You got to have some of them spinach greens and stuff that you don't like. You got to have some of that stuff that just awful cough medicine when you get sick. That's the way preaching is. So Christian, beware of your heart. Jeremiah says, it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? So guard it. Guard it well. Lock it up for God. And when the word of God comes on, just say, okay, bring it on. No matter what it is, bring it on. And you know what? God will smile. God will smile. I guarantee it. I can prove that with the Bible. And tonight, we're going to study the judgment seat of Christ. And in that day, your reactions will be analyzed by Christ himself. So be sure, be sure that you please God in your reactions to what's said over the pulpit. Be sure that you're following the Spirit of God. And, and you know what I do? I pray for you. I pray for you. Because I know the the bad influence the world can have. Even when you don't know it's influencing you, it's trying to do, get you to do something that ain't right. Beware. Glad you're here this morning. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, I think of old Jeremiah. God, he was called the weeping prophet. He preached hard at folks. But yet, it broke his heart to see the spiritual condition of the people he preached to. And God, I look at it at the world and I look at um, the average church member in the average church and it breaks my heart. They have no faith in you. They have no desire to please you. At least that I can tell, Lord, but you have an advantage over me. God, you can look at their heart. So, God, I pray you examine hearts this morning. God, I pray as these dear folks go home, God, they'll think about um, what's preached and what they read in their Bible every day. And God, Holy Spirit of God, I pray you just help them to receive what they are given. And God, if it touches them, repent of something. Uh, God, but obey. Not because we have to, because it's going to get us to heaven. Oh, no. We obey because we love you. We obey because we want to please you. Because of what you've done for us. Help us, oh God. When we go home, to be as glad for the preaching of the word of God is when we were sitting under it. Help us to take it and incorporate it into our daily lives. God help me. I want to be a Bible preacher. I don't, I, I try to tell stories and books and some personal experience just to folk, keep folks interest. But Lord, they need what your Bible says more than anything. Help me to be a faithful servant. And Lord, help me never get to the space again. I, I, I felt like Jeremiah. Where I don't want to preach anymore, Lord. Help me to always have the burden to give the word of God to people. Men and women, boys and girls, God. The way they are and the place that they are. Help us now as we go. And come back and get us soon, Lord, please, would you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen.